thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is a great, great honor for us um, at CNN, and we uh, are delighted to be partnering with the, the Clinton Global Initiative and have this extraordinary panel with us um, to talk about what is really um, one of the most dramatic crises in healthcare that I think the world has ever seen, uh, both in terms of the scale, the severity, and the kind of drama of it all. Um, Paul Farmer, you were just in uh, Liberia. Give us a sense on the ground. What does it look like? Well, I mean, I think one of the images that people have in mind is of some, you know, chaos or that, that, that's visible. That's not really what we saw either in uh, Monrovia, the capital, or in the rural areas. Um, you know, there is a health crisis there is that's affecting the travel and economy. It's difficult to get in and out of Liberia. We got in with the help of, of the United Nations. It's a group of physicians. Um, but there seemed to be a calm and resolve, which among, uh, we were mostly with medical professionals, of authorities, uh, uh, with the president also. There seems to be calm and resolve, uh, you know, that something dramatic needs to, to happen. But there's also a sense, I think quite correct, that the, 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 the staff, the stuff, the space to do the work and the systems are not yet there. So why, that's- Why that. is it, um, the simple question I suppose is why has it spread so far so fast? Uh, a very weak health system is why it spread so far so fast. And what, what I mean by that is um, after the uh, war, and this is not true uh, only of Liberia, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have other examples from people who know far more than I do, this, this disruption of medical systems has, takes years and significant investments to rebuild, that it needs to go from communities to clinics to hospitals. And um, that had not been rebuilt, where there had been some significant improvements, Liberia has been noted for sharp declines in deaths due to AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and maternal mortality. But that has been shaken, and that system, and, and has tottered. And one of the biggest problems, as you can imagine now, is that there'll be other problems beyond Ebola that are significantly worsened by the Ebola. Chelsea and Clinton, um, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has just put out a model, a, a simulation that says if, if we continue on our current trajectory, by the end of uh, next year, I think it's by the middle of 2015, we could have maybe one and a half million people affected. Do you, do you think that's true? So, I mean, not even by the middle of next year, by the middle of January of 2015, the, the caseload in Liberia doubles every 15 to 20 days. The caseload in Sierra Leone doubles every 30 to 40 days. Um, so we're truly watching exponential growth, which is why we need to have an exponential acceleration in our coordinated efforts to combat Ebola, particularly in Liberia and Sierra Leone, as well as in Guinea. Um, to build a little bit on what Paul was saying, I think if we look at both historical and contemporary examples, um, we see that that pace of Ebola case growth doesn't have to be. I mean, Uganda's had five Ebola outbreaks in the last 14 years, none of which have become epidemics because there's a strong healthcare system in place. There's a reason that um, there's been one isolated case in Senegal, and it's been geographically contained in Nigeria because there are more robust health systems in place. So certainly our collective hope is that this is a call to action not only to combat Ebola, but to help these countries build their healthcare systems to better prevent the next Ebola case from becoming an epidemic and to better serve the needs of their populations more broadly. Melissa Gafuan, explain to us what is happening on the ground, you know, with a healthcare system, with a, this a developing country, a poor country, with a rudimentary healthcare system. What do you think could, could be changed to make, this, uh, to make this problem be addressed more effectively? Thank you, Farid. Uh, if you indulge me, let me bring you greetings from Her Excellency Mr. Dylan Johnson Salif, President of the Republic of Liberia who could not attend the UN General Assembly because she has to lead the fight on the ground and from Liberians both at home and abroad. Uh, we are a small country. We have had our own history of difficulties. Uh, for upwards of 14 years, we were embroiled in one of the worst civil conflicts 
on the African continent that uh, decimated our small population. We have a four million population. We lost more than 200,000 of our, of our people during the war. Uh, since 2003, we have enjoyed peace and stability, thanks to all the partners, the UN, the US, everyone from the international community has contributed materially to the peace. Now, we were be rebuilding. We were experiencing growth, percentage averaging about 6 to 7 percent, and that we were dealing with some of the, uh, the, the challenges of a post-conflict fragile state. Now, Ebola attacked us at the very time when we were taking off, and our health system was not as robust as we would have wanted it because we had competing challenges in the rural sector, the energy sector, and every sector. Uh, so it met us at this time. Now, we are a traditional society. Our people have clung to cultures for the ages. Ebola not, is not only a deadly disease, but it comes in direct contradiction of our, of our culture. In the Ebola environment, the mother is told not to touch the sick son or the sick husband because he, she will get infected. Mm. In the Ebola environment, burial practices that our people have clung to for ages, they cannot do that. Because in some of our environments, when a person dies, the ritual will entail that they wash the body and some family members will have to wash their faces with the water of the, uh, of, 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 of the dead. That's part of the practice. And now they're being told that they cannot do that. So it's taking some time for our people who have, who have gotten used to this in green culture to backpedal from it. So it's one of the challenges. We are enlisting the support of everybody in the Liberian society. Government officials, politicians, the imams, the pastors, uh, everyone with influence, Liberians in the diaspora, to call and to talk because we can do everything, but our people have to start to yeah. now know that the challenge requires us changing the culture a little bit. Paul Farmer, you have traveled all over the world, worked in so many different places. Is this problem of uh, culture a very big obstacle? How, how have you seen it overcome in the past? Because this seems like more than just needing a better delivery system, yeah. need, you know, a technocratic solution. Well, you know, um, funerary practices uh, vary all over the world, and it would be a mistake to not understand the culture and social practices that led to transmission, you know, through infected secretions. That's part of our job, right? And then the next step is to say, but where do they fit on a list of problems? And, and that varies from place to place. But building a strong healthcare system does not vary. That is, is structural intervention that can be really quite similar from place to place. We've been working with Liberian. What, do, what is a good healthcare system? A look good like? healthcare system goes from communities, uh, community health workers, to clinics where the majority of healthcare can be delivered. You don't need to go to a hospital, but you need hospitals too when you're critically ill. Mm -hmm. Ebola is a classic example, right? Of some people do get do get really critically ill. It's a hemorrhagic fever, but when we see um, and I pardon a little bit of jargon, case fatality rate, so fatality varies so much from place to place and epidemic to epidemic. That's a sure sign that the health system is weak Interesting. because most people with Ebola should not die. And, and to build on what Paul is saying, you know, it's, it is, of course, about the human resources for health, but it's also about the system in which those doctors and nurses and lab technicians operate. Um, so although the kind of current doctor-to-population ratio is rather staggering, so in the United States, for example, we have more than 240 doctors for every 100,000 people. In Liberia, it's less than one for every 100,000 people. Wow. Um, that is clearly a significant challenge. Um, but what is also a significant challenge is the environment in which health workers operate. So as one example, the minister and I were talking backstage about an airlift that we helped organize through CGI that left on Saturday. 
that thus far is the largest airlift to leave from the United States to the Ebola infected countries. And we're incredibly grateful to our CGI partners, Direct Relief, to Merck and to Becton Dickinson, who donated more than 100 tons of medical supplies and protective material. Only now are those supplies being distributed effectively to more than 100 partners in Liberia and Sierra Leone because when the plane landed, there weren't enough trucks to load all of the materials on for immediate distribution. So it's important to focus on the healthcare workers. It's necessary, but it's not yet sufficient. It's also about kind of the larger environment in which the healthcare workers operate, both for this immediate response, ensuring that you know, there's enough transportation support to get people there and the commodities needed, right. but also then enough support to distribute those people and commodities to the areas where they're most needed. Tell us a little bit about the foreign policy of, uh, of a disease outbreak. Uh, how much do you have to worry about neighboring countries, uh, you know, putting restrictions on trade and travel that are then going to affect the Liberian economy that then create a kind of downward spiral where you have more and more problems? Yeah, Farid, uh, let me, before I talk about the uh, isolation we've talked about, let me thank all members of the international community that have so far solidarized with us. We receive hands of empathy, which the Liberian government and the Liberian people are very proud of. But at the same time, we receive isolation, especially from some of um, our colleagues on the wider African continent. As I speak, there are Liberian students stranded in some African countries who are not being allowed to enter other African countries who are sending me emails about some of the challenges. This issue was discussed at the level of the African Union and that uh, the African Union has taken a position. It was discussed at the UN Security Council. It has taken a position advising against that. Even the General Assembly, the World Health Organization does not advise this. The uh, ICAO does not advise this. So, you know, this thing, uh, Ebola came with a lot of hysteria and paranoia. So one can understand the initial knee-jerk reactions from some of our colleagues. But now um, they need to take evidence-based actions because some of the actions of isolation, some of them border on stigmatization, and they are also reaching a point where they are affecting relief activities. Humanitarian workers trying to come to us, because one of the problems we face now is a deficit in the number of critically needed health workers. Because out of uh, our small community of health workers, 177 have been affected, more than 85 have died about 85 have died so far, so it brings fear. It takes some time, but the entire community, the global health community, we need a surge and we need to deal with this deficit. But if health workers from their countries who may want to come to us and help us, but their own countries are putting in restrictions, it does not help our situation. So we cannot have a situation where countries that are affected are effectively quarantined. Paul, give us a quick capsule on um, what is Ebola, how does it spread, how do you not get it, yeah. and why, do work, why, why does it seem that healthcare workers have been infected? Ebola is, a, is, a, is a, from a family of viruses called the filoviridae. It's a hemorrhagic fever it's discovered in, or first described in 1976, and in, in, interestingly, in a very similar uh, uh, circumstance, not in terms of magnitude, but what occurred. Poor infection control spread through reused needles, took out nurses first, nurses, family members, etc. So we've known since the be you know the first time that it, it was spread by infected secretions, right? So it's and not contagious. It it is it's infectious, but not airborne in humans, as far as we know, and. Most of the deaths among the healthcare workers, you know, according to our mutual friend, Dr. Moses Masakoy, uh, who was with the Clinton Foundation, has been seconded to this response. Most of the healthcare workers, he, he believes, will be shown to have not had proper infection control, either at work or at home, because there are, you know, a lot of families affected now. So the spread, as far as we can tell, is infected secretions, you know, 
not to be too graphic, but if you're, you know, if you're nursing someone as a mother or as a nurse or doctor, right, and they're sick, they're, they vomit, they have diarrhea, um, you, you're helping clean them up. So that's why this is a, a disease really of caregivers, mm -hmm. your mother, your sister, people who care for you. And I, I think the minister said it, it's against, you know, Liberian tradition, culture, not to take care of people, not to, to and that's true in many places in the world. We don't have evidence that I know of, of other kinds of transmission, aerosolized transmission, not in humans. Although, Paul, one of the real challenges is that Ebola also lives for a few days after someone has passed away. So that's why when the minister was talking about the funeral yeah. practices um, as being such a significant challenge, you know, most people assume that once someone has died, you know, whatever killed them has left their mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. And tragically in Ebola, that's not true. Oh. Yeah. Chelsea, what, what are the lessons you think this teaches us about other uh, diseases, the spread of disease? You've just finished up your, your uh, uh, doctorate in public health. Because what I wonder about is we see, again, the speed with which this traveled. We worry about things like H1N1, you know, uh, a, a species jumping viruses and how fast they could spread. Did anything about this make you, look, make you think to yourself, we've got to worry about other, you know, this could happen somewhere else in another way and it would be equally problematic? Absolutely. You know, the WHO budget for um, pandemic and emergency response was cut by more than 50 percent wow. from last year to this year. And so, you know, Mag Margaret Chan and the WHO have been criticized for not having had a more robust response. They didn't have the resources to have a more robust response. And if, you know, heaven forbid, there were to be another epidemic outbreak somewhere else in the world, it would only further underscore how weak our current global health governance is to mitigate um, challenges like Ebola. So certainly I hope once we kind of do what we need to do as an international community to support um, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea to mitigate their epidemics, to build um, more robust healthcare systems. We also simultaneously think about what we need as a global coordinating mechanism. Yeah. We should not need to reinvent this wheel every time we have a challenge like H1N1 or Ebola. And that's currently what we do. I mean, currently sort of we kind of you know, try to diagnose the challenge and then we try to diagnose the response and we lose many weeks if not months um, toward having a coordinated effort with one UN sanctioned head with the resources necessary to deploy. We need more resources banked. We need a stronger mechanism in place so that when the next challenge comes and it will come, we can respond more effectively. Yeah, if I can just add one upbeat note about this on Sunday, Went to I know it, it's <laughs> you, you, you got to look for uh, you got to be upbeat yeah. how you can, but I went to say goodbye to our, our mutual friend and who knows the minister as well, um, Dr. Moses. They were opening up. Um, uh, this was actually Saturday. They were opening up um, Sunday, which is yesterday. I, I'm a little two two days ago. Two days ago. Two days ago. What's my name again? <laughs> um, and he wasn't there, um, but I saw. There, there's a WHO consultant who I had met, but this is what kind of consultant. She, a physician from Uganda, had already weathered five Ebola epidemics, and she was with a team of Ugandan physicians and, physicians and administrators who had helped the Liberians set up um, this major Ebola treatment center and uh, you know, in order to do that, you, you need res you need money. Yeah. You know, you to bring a team, a pretty large team, in fact, from Uganda to um, Monrovia to say nothing of rural areas. You need resources, and we also had, I'm proud to say, um, some of our Rwandan colleagues uh, from northern Rwanda, um, where we together ha had worked to build a, uh, a modern hospital on the Ugandan border. They were there in Monrovia. So there is a lot of international solidarity that's just now coming uh, to pass. And I think that lifted the mood as the Liberian ambassador to the United States just told us on the way in here. I mean, that, that's a really effective way to marshal expertise and to 
you know, to, to stop transmission when there's proper uh, care and infection control. How much of all this is a product of your very long, very hard civil war? Well, it, this is um, part of a legacy of a period of difficulty. Uh, the civil war eventuated into one of the uh, biggest collapses of economies ever. Uh, more than 90% decline in GDP. Wow. Uh, in terms of debt to GDP ratio, we have one of the worst in the world. But we have succeeded in putting ourselves back on the high road of recovery. Uh, so this came in at a very unfortunate time. Post-conflict fragile state doing some of the right things, although it missed challenges. We had our own bumps in the road. Uh, partners are coming. The Clinton uh, uh, Health Access Initiative have been working in Liberia, I think, since 2006, helping us with maternal uh, uh, health and other matters. The head of our, um, our, one of the heads of our Ebola initiative is Dr. Moses Masakwe, who was seconded from this initiative. So. All the partners have been helping us to build the system. But coming back to the earlier question as to why this disease spread the way it spread, part of it is that it doesn't come with a peculiar Ebola-like symptom. We've had perennial problems with malaria. Ebola presents itself like malaria, like fever, like typhoid fever, like diarrhea. So our people at the outset felt that they were experiencing those other diseases. Right. And so the care you gave a malaria patient or a malaria infected relative, that was the care that our people gave Ebola infected people until people started dying in droves in families. Some families, uh, maybe you only see one person in some villages. So we are coming up to this realization very sadly that there is a dangerous disease around that needs to translate into a radical change of our attitudes. And so as we ramp up the support, we need to build more treatment centers because part of the problem was that the disease ran faster than our collective ability, the government, the international partners, the WHO, the US Centers for Disease Control, and every other person, the disease ran faster than our ability to continue it. Now we, we are ramping up the number of treatment centers we build that, that, that are needed. Just Sunday, we dedicated a few. Part of the U.S. surge that President uh, Obama uh, announced, which we are very appreciative of, will be to build about 17 treatment centers because we need more beds. Because over a period of the past two weeks, we had this uh, very, very sad situation of not being able to admit people in, in treatment facilities because there were no beds, there were no doctors. Now, when we look at a crisis like this, it seems all-consuming. It seems uh, that the world's attention is fixed on it. And the result, Chelsea, you say, is that it actually means that people are dying in other places because of the withdrawal of healthcare workers and the focus on I mean, there this. is now an invisible toll to Ebola. Um, you, the minister w and Paul have both mentioned that Liberia had made significant strides on various health objectives, um, including maternal mortality. Unfortunately, in the last couple of months in both Liberia and Sierra Leone, maternal mortality has gone back up, as has infant mortality, as have deaths related to traffic accidents, for example, um, because the healthcare system has been understandably narrowly focused on Ebola. Um, other people have suffered the consequences of that which again circles back to um, kind of this shared belief I think we all have that um, the Ebola response has to only be the vanguard of an effort to help Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, but particularly Liberia, build a more robust healthcare system to better weather the next time there's a challenge like this, um, not only to serve those victims and their families, but to ensure that no one else suffers the consequences of redistributed resources. Paul, is there a silver bullet, I know you're going to say no, but my question is really, is there, if there are one or two things that we should be doing, you know, when you look at these countries, if, you know, if time were short and you were told, pick two things you could fix here, what would be, what, what are the, the key variables? Well, I think, 
I think there are some um, potential positive outcomes. One is, just go back to, to this, is there a way or could we force ourselves to link emergency responses to long-term capacity building? That's I think the answer is obviously yes, we can. And if this reveals the fragility of other approaches that are not linking you know, emergency uh, assistance to long-term capacity building, which includes training of Liberian health professionals, then we should say these are not right. the, the uh, approaches we should be funding most. So that just revealing mm -hmm. um, the weaknesses of what get called in our field vertical approaches that aren't linked to this broader mission, I think that that could be good. And it could even be good for Liberia, as tragic as the situation is, because, uh, you know, we need a Liberian healthcare workforce, community health workers, nurses, managers, physicians, including specialists. Um, uh, you know, and another is, there, this is a transnational epidemic. You know, it, it calls for, meaning it's not gonna be contained by a border. In a place I was, Grand Gita, you know, you're not gonna see uh, a demarcation of a county line. It's it's in a forest and you know abuts other counties and other countries, and so there needs to be this kind of coordination. Which I, I mentioned the example from the Ugandan experts there, or the Rwandans. Chelsea, I have to ask you. Um, you are somebody who has knows a great deal about medicine, about health. Why did you decide you didn't want to know the sex of your? <laughs> there are so few mysteries in life, Reed, in which. Um, any answer is a happy one. And so my husband and I decided that we would enjoy this mystery for you know, the nine plus months that we were granted. Uh, and we are eager um, to find out what God will have given us. But isn't it strange that the doctors around you know, but you don't know? No, I think the doctors around me know lots of things that I don't know. <laughs> well, That's I actually not true. <laughs> I just want to be clear that if there is any trouble, Paul is a doctor, Harvard Medical School doctor. You know, we could do, we could take no care trouble. of things here. No? I, I, I trust Paul with my life, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Melissa, let me give you the last word. Um, what is it that you want the world to know about Liberia in this situation? Well, Liberia is a small country, having a difficult past, along with Sierra Leone, Guinea, and others. We were on the right trajectory until Ebola hit us. We are fighting tooth and nail to disentangle ourselves from this difficulty. We appreciate the uh, solidarity that has come from the international community, governments, NGOs, private sector. We've done much, but we need to do more. Every day that passes, people are dying. So like some of us, I lost my administrative assistant some three weeks ago. Uh, every day, we, even af out of the country, we are afraid to take our phones because it may just be someone telling you that a friend or relative or a compatriot has fallen. So we want a surge of action. We want solidarity. We want empathy. Everyone who can do his part, let him or her do their part. As we hear these uh, apocalyptic predictions as to what will happen in the next few weeks, they, I take it to be a call for action to humankind because it's going to be tragically shameful for us to sit as if we are watching a movie on a television or pre-recorded movie with a predetermined climax. There are lives around these projections. If anyone in the world can do anything to save one life, it is one life very precious. And we'll be very grateful for that. Well, let's, let's close on that, uh, on that note. But <laughs> let's also thank uh, all the people and institutions that are doing extraordinary work. The Clinton Global Initiative with Chelsea, Paul Farmer, your uh, Partners as Health has always done things, and all the people out there who work, and all of us who have visited, know the incredible conditions under which these healthcare workers do things heroically, month after month, year after year, the kind that 
frankly, it would be difficult for us to do for a week. So thank you to all of those who are, who are actually on the ground helping. Thank you all very much. Thank you for eating. It was great. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. President, you uh, are going to be out of a job for the first I'm time out in of decades. Job already. You are already out of a job. <laughs> and you, you made a video in which you uh, applied for uh, employment right. at various places, tried your hand at various things. I mean, it's a very serious uh, apply. I mean, I hope it will be answered. But the story is I have a granddaughter. She decided that I have to do it. And since I'm, since I'm unemployed, I followed her. So she, she made the movie? Yes, she, it was her idea, and uh, she forced me to act. It was my first career as an actor in my life. You were a very good pizza delivery person, I have to tell you. And that, that, that part, I thought you particularly showed skill. Well, this is an unexpected compliment <laughs> for, <an email>. <laughs> <laughs> for a man who doesn't have the experience. Um, when, when you look at the Middle East today, yes. do you think that Israel's position is less secure? And let me pre preface it by asking it to you this way. When I was in graduate school, we would study the military balance of power in the Middle East. We would see that Israel was up against the great Egyptian army, the great Iraqi army, the great Syrian army, and those were the countries that Israel worried about having to go to war with. Now, you know, Egypt is internally convulsed, Iraq is internally convulsed, battling ISIS, and Syria is in free fall. Does, does that reality mean that Israel is more secure? In a way, yes. You know, actually, there are no really more armies, and I don't think there will be more wars. It's being replaced by terror. It's a different sort of a conflict. Usually you had two armies, one won, the other lost. But now you have hundreds and hundreds of small terrorist groups. They don't have a policy, they are more of a protest. They don't have it tomorrow, they are going back to yesterday. And they became the real problem for the Arab world more than for Israel. And we stand informally, and in the future it will be more formal, at the same front against terrorism. The Middle East, in my judgment, is in transition all the way. We should wake up to a new Middle East. It takes pain to come over this uh, great divide, but all of us are moving in the same direction. You but, but a transition to what? A transition from, I think we can see, from repressive dictatorships, I suppose, from Libya to Syria, but to what? No, I think the transi transition is from living on the land to living on science. Land, you could conquer by armies or defend by armies. Science, you cannot conquer by armies. But you think ISIS is living in that new world? I don't think they're going to have a living in the future. They belong to the past. You see the fact that uh, there are no more, the, the age of stone is over, it's not because there is a shortage of stones, but it's a new age, and you cannot conquer it by stones. So I believe we are moving, all of us, and as I see it, I can see where the great hope is residing. There are 400 million people in the Middle East, Arabs. It's, uh, most of them are very poor, without jobs, without hope. But they have one great advantage. 60% of them are young people below the age of 25. I wouldn't follow anymore the Sunnites and the Shiites. I would follow the young girls and boys who want to enter the new age of science. There is the only hope to escape poverty and to introduce growth. But you are painting a wonderful picture about what might be years, maybe decades from now. Right now, what is going on is a raging civil war in Syria that has morphed into this ter terrorist uh, organization. Do you th are you that confident that this will all be beaten back? Yes, I think because the problem today, even in the eyes of the Arabs, is no longer Israel. The problem is really terror. They destroy country after a country. They destroy Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Yemen, Libya. 
and uh, they are being left hanging in the air. And it's cost a great deal of life and blood and hatred. So I think they don't have really a message and they don't have a future. If you don't have a message for the future, you don't have neither a future nor a message. Do you believe that as a result of this um, relations, this common enemy of terrorism, relations between Israel and the Arab countries and, and Middle Eastern countries are inevitably going to get better? Undoubtedly, in my eyes. You know, we live in a global world. I don't, I'm not sure that the globality had it in mind or planned it. The fact is that globality put an end to racism. You cannot be global and racist, finished. You cannot be global and even nationalistic, finished. Globality doesn't hang on power, but on goodwill. They don't have an army. Even globality doesn't have a global government. It's all based on goodwill, on good products, on good relations. And it changed the world. You know, few people made a greater revolution than Lenin and Stalin in Russia or Robespierre in uh, France. They didn't kill anybody. They didn't arrest anybody. But they changed the world in our eyes. They are the future. And the globality has another, another advantage. It's a future that doesn't have to carry a past. Because all the other form of governments are dependent or remember a very demanding and uh, difficult past. Here is new together, and it's not just global, it's also individual. If, you were to, if I would be talking to a, an Arab statesman, even somebody well disposed toward Israel, what he, I think, would say to me is, yes, Arabs and Israelis could be uh, friends, but Israel has to give the Palestinians a state. What I agree say? with him. I think we have to give to them the state. I don't have the slightest doubt about it. <laughs> you know, I'm either too young or too old. To pay, to pay too much attention to what people say. I would rather see what they do. And uh, maybe in the conversation, some people will say this and that, but the official position and the real desire of Israel is to have two states, an Arab state and a Jewish state. And I think that's also the conclusion of the Arabs. The problem with the Palestinians is they are split. There is a camp that wants peace, headed by Abbas, and there is a camp that still continues with terror, or Hamas. For the Arabs, I believe the future is Abbas, not Hamas. There are reports that you were very disappointed with Prime Minister Netanyahu's government, and that you asked two of his ministers to break away from the government and form uh, and force new elections. Is they that true? They didn't say I said it. They said they some people say I said it. <laughs> well, you know, people are quoting different things. The problem is not person, personal. I mean, I would try. But do you think Prime Minister Netanyahu was serious, is serious about a two-state solution and working toward it? I think it was simple for him to declare the, his support for the two-state solution. It goes against the tradition of the right in Israel. And this speech at the bar University was a departure. So he made a step. I hope he will continue to do so. He said something, though, during the Gaza operation. He said uh, there will be a uh, continued Israeli military presence on the West Bank for eternity or some, 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 for as long as I can imagine. That seems incompatible with the idea of a, of a Palestinian state on the West Bank. Well, uh, he's, he's speaking about, he was speaking about security. But there are different sorts of security. For example, we made peace with the Jordanians. Jordanians are Arabs as well. We don't have Israeli soldiers in Jordan. We didn't even ask Jordan to be demilitarized. So there are different ways to do so. And uh, that's now being negotiated. Were you disappointed with Prime Minister Netanyahu's term in office so far? Uh, I'm not in a position to say so because I still have some obligation to keep away a little bit from politics until people will get used to them as a simple citizen. Until you get your new job. Yes. 
It's not a matter of personalities. I would never go into personalities. I think Israel does not have and does have a choice to live in peace with the Arabs. They are neighbors. They can be our friends. We can be their friends. We can help them to enter the new age. And we believe, I believe, the better they'll have it, the better we shall have it. Who was the first American president you met? Kennedy, President Kennedy. Um, You're too young. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you, do you think there are a number of people who feel that President Obama has been too uh, passive or disengaged in the Middle East? Do you agree with that assessment? No. No. I think President Obama met all the serious requests we have had. And I think he has his own style, and he's in a different position as well. The other presidents never had uh, such a China, never had such an India, never had the world crisis, never paid so much for wars. Several so presidents is not just a new president, but he comes in in a new age. And when I look, I can see some real achievements of the president. I know that uh, the, po the polls doesn't show it, show it, but I'm not impressed. Uh, for the last month, I didn't see that uh, an American lost his life. And in spite of it, he went to fight for humanity in Syria and Iraq. You call yourself an indispensable country. I say the world needs America as an indispensable leader, even more than you are. So, and I see unemployment is going a little bit down. I see that you don't import any more oil. I see the health assurance is moving ahead. You know, when I became pre president in our country, the love investigation, investigations and committees of investigation, usually to find out what went wrong. I said, what I'm going to do as a president, you have to continue the tradition. So I decided to investigate not what went wrong, but what went right. <laughs> You have really to learn from what is right, not from what is wrong, and copy it. So I look at it, and I know the troubles. It's not simple to run the United States. It's very hard to be elected a president here, as far as I know. And in every country, once you're elected, you have to keep the job. It's also very difficult. And I think uh, the president has shown a great deal of intellect, eloquence, and uh, he has to fight and face uninvited problems of a complicated. Uh, I think now I feel that the United States is supporting the acts he took in face of seeing people cutting the head of other people. It is a human declaration. I Do think the world would be wrong if Do America you wouldn't lead to it. Do you worry, though, that we are being uh, that we are, in a sense, playing to what the terrorists want, uh, that we are, we are taking the bait and we are going to be dragged into a very messy five or six cornered civil war in which there are really no good guys. What do they want? It's not clear. You know, in our case, we left Gaza willingly, unilaterally. We made it free and open. And they start firing. I ask myself and I ask them, why are you firing? You want freedom, you got it. You want independent, you got it. Why do you shoot at civilians? And unfortunately, the answer is not uh, rational, but emotional. And in, with the great incitement, I just uh, showed, saw the Pope, I told him, look, we have to renew faith. A lot of people in Gaza would say it was never open. You, Israel controlled the land, sea, air, uh, electronic borders, and they feel it's an open-air prison. What is, what is going to happen to Gaza? Well, first of all, if you would like to remain, we could have remained. So why do they say it? We left, we took away all the settlements. We have 22 settlements, 8,000 settlers. It was difficult for them. They build the homes, they, create, they have children. We have to have 75,000 policemen to bring them back. Why did we do it? 
If he would like to control Gaza, he would remain it. I think that what should happen is the Palestinians have to unite. I think Abbas is the right candidate to do so. And I think there are many ways to do it, including that all the aid that is being given to Gaza will flow through his hands, not to build missiles, but to build schools and help the people. Do you worry about the rise of a uh, global campaign or, or mood that delegitimizes Israel? Um, I am worried, but I don't think they have it too. What do they want? I mean, the people who criticize us, I know there are many. They didn't say a word when Israel was bombed by missiles. There were 4,000 missiles aimed at civilian life. Mothers couldn't have a sleep holding their babies in their hands. What would they do? They didn't raise their voice. Now, if you don't raise the voice when somebody shoots at you missiles, I'm not impressed by the voice when somebody is criticizing us to stop it. Do you worry that there is a rise of a new anti-Semitism in Europe, or is it a sim just a cyclical phenomenon? I don't know what's happening to Europe. Europe has now a problem because they didn't have enough children, so they brought in foreign workers. They hoped that the foreign workers would be integrated in the European culture, the European tradition. It didn't happen. There are today 50 million foreign workers, and the Europeans are worried about their identity. And I think the sentiment against the foreign workers is also unjustified. And uh, it's not the right solution. In America, I handled it differently. There was always uh, a little bit of anti-Semitism in Europe. I think it's a sickness of them, not a sickness of us. I don't think that we should be the subject for uh, anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism was raised in my judgment the moment Moses went down from Mount Sinai and speaking about freedom and equality and saying, I prefer of all attractions in the world, the moral one, neither money nor power. It raised a great deal of opposition and accusation. People didn't understand it. They couldn't understand why are the Jewish, the Jewish people sacrificing themselves for principles. So I know that uh, I wouldn't judge myself by my accusers. I would rather judge myself by the dreams. A nation must have a dream. There's an American dream, there's a Jewish dream, and always you are young as your dream. How old are you? Now 91. What is... What's wrong? <laughs> what is your routine? What, what do we, what, what, tell us what, what, what should we do to get to 91? I feel that you're asking like my granddaughter. <laughs> I wake up around four up past four in the morning. I'm reading for a couple of hours. Then I'm working the whole day. I enjoy working more than vacationing. I don't know why are people taking vacations, what for? <laughs> it's a waste of time. I enjoy my day work more than sitting on the beach with a dog. He doesn't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> And, and you read uh, astonishingly widely. The last time uh, we saw each other, you were talking about brain science. You were reading neurobiology. Yes, I think that the key, I, I believe finally the world will be governed by three sorts of governments. The nation governments will remain, but they become more and more weak and weaker because they cannot answer the questions economies in the hands of the global companies, not in the hands of the national government, and so it's terrible. So they really don't have a role, but the husband of the state, they will be more and more concerned with domestic problems. Then the global companies will look to the future, to the innovation, to the new discoveries, but then we still have many people who are either sick or even statistics, and they cut heads. And we have to govern them as well. 
We cannot govern without knowing how does it happen. The key to it is in the human brain. The human brain is the most illustrious instrument we have, but it enables us to build an artificial brain. It doesn't permit us to understand how our own brain functions. We are strangers to ourselves. So the third government will be individual, one national, one universal, the third individual. Because the moment a man, a lady, will know what's happening in their own brain, what forces them to make a decision, or to give them a choice to make a decision, most of them, if not all of them, will prefer to make a decision which goes in the happy direction, in the modest direction, in the moderate direction. And I think there was already sensational achievements in the research of the brain, including in the last month, there are some sensational discoveries that may increase life expectancy and improve memories by 25%. So we have seen the video, so we know the options available. What are you going to do next? What? What are you going to do next? What will, what's the next 10 years of Shimon Peres' life going to look like? Until now, I don't have a moment free. <laughs> I mean, I'm first of all, I'm a curious person. And I'm a dreaming man. And I believe that a human being should be basically optimistic. But you're not looking for another job? You're not looking for another post? I, I'm busy. Sign? No, I'm very busy. I, I, I don't need, you know, when you're a president, you live in a golden cage. Now, if you like gold, stay. <laughs> if you like to fly, leave the cage and fly <laughs> like a bird. <laughs> so I prefer flying. I think it's a better employment than watching gold. And I'm busy as ever, uh, and one of them, I want to be of help to bring in the Middle East into the new age by bringing in global companies, by bringing goodwill. And I must say, we st I started only two weeks ago, the response is very, very encouraging from all sides, companies from all countries. Because today, no, a CEO is usually an educated person. And when he comes back home, and his son or daughter is asking him, Father, what are you doing? You're exploiting poverty, you're exploiting poor people. He says, no, no, no. I'm trying to help community. And he has to help community. Otherwise, his business will not succeed. He depends on goodwill. He has to create goodwill. And many of them are really donating as much as they can. Now they can help the global companies, more than the national governments, to bring the Middle East into the new age and save it from poverty, from hatred, from terror. And if you want, this is not my job, this is what I'm doing. All right, you will come back, I hope, next year and give us a brief on how this has gone for the next year. Shimon Peres, the one and only Shimon Peres. Thank you so much. Thanks.